PNR Networks is a member of Patreon. Show your love for our shows by joining our ongoing fundraising campaign and get some fantastic perks in return. Check it out and become a Patreon sponsor. You can sign up at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, backslash PNR Networks. And thanks for your support. This podcast is a member of the Blueberry Network. Blueberry. No E's. That's Blueberry, B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Dot com. Blueberry dot com. This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. It's Kim versus TC in the Battle of the Lists. My list is better. My list is better. My list is better. No, it's not. My list is better. Kim or TC, who has the better list? From Subject Cinema, this is Front Row 5 and 10 with Kim Brown and T.C. Kirkham. Hi guys, welcome to another week here on Front Row 5 and 10 brought to you by the good people that bring you Subject Cinema. That would be me and him, the me being Kim Brown. And the him being T.C. Kirkham. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, we're a day late this week. We're sorry we had some... We're, we're getting ready for a real frigid weekend up here. Yeah. And when we decided to go get supplies and got in a little bit later than we planned. So we're a day late, but not a dollar short. We still have some great lists. And we hope that you'll be there and uh, give us your lists mm-hmm. by writing to us at front row at pnrnetworks.com. Yep. And... Uh, Lists are always fun. Yes, they are. We have other things coming up list-oriented after the first of the year. Uh-huh. So you might want to keep an eye on that. We'll talk more about that as we get to them and when they start going up up, uh, up on the inter- interwebs. Yep. Right now, though, my pick. Yes. My list this week, and I had very specific rules, which Kim has already told me she broke. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a rebel. Uh, our top ten. I'm like the wind, baby. Our top ten live action movies, narrative or documentary, mm-hmm. starring animals. Yes. Uh, animals have to be a focal point, or it doesn't have to be know. in the title, but it should be a major part of the film. Yes. Like for me, a good example of a film that has an animal in the title but really has nothing to do with the movie is The Strange Little Cat. That would not have qualified for this. No. no, I know you don't like that movie. I, I thought it was like intriguing as hell. But the the cat is only in like three tiny scenes. The cat and the cat is neither strange and, nor and, little, and it's treated very badly by a couple of the people in the movie. But the movie was great, but it had nothing really to do with the cat. That wouldn't have qualified. Um, I do have. I got to say, before you start with the list, yeah, I decided also to name my favorite animated film with it with animals, okay. just as a, an honorable mention because we didn't put animated stuff in here, and I thought it would be fun to do. And it's a movie that I think everybody should seek out if they've never seen, and it is hard to find. I don't. I didn't check. I don't think it's on Amazon or Netflix. You really might have to dig to find it. But it's a delightful film that had me in hysterics throughout almost its entire run. Mm -hmm. And it won my Best Animated Picture of 2009. And if you've never seen it, you really should. It's called My Dog Tulip. It stars Christopher (laughs) Christopher Plummer Mm -hmm. uh, as the voice of J.K. Ackerley, uh, J.R. Ackerley, the the gentleman who owned Tulip, an Alsatian bitch with a peeing, pooping, and vomiting habit. And it, it it's truly absolutely hilarious. If you've never seen it, you need to. It's a um, great movie. <laughs> we we should stress for those of you out there who have children it, and, it, just, it, it and does just have heard, some doggy and, style. And, and just it. heard, oh, it's a cartoon about a dog. We'll it's have to a, it's get an that, adult. You know. It's a cartoon meant for. Uh. Uh, it, it was uh, it was R rated when it came out, so yeah. it, it's definitely. But it's a brilliant. It's it's from his book about the same thing. It's beautifully animated. Features the final performance of the wonderful Lynn Redgrave as well as Al- Isabella Rossellini and a few other people. And it is even you. You were sitting there terribly uncomfortable. And I was on the floor. I was very uncomfortable. It's a freaking hilarious. Well, there movie. was one. You've never seen it. Seek it out. My dog Tulip is oh, my man. favorite animated animal okay. film. 
So, we're starting with me. Yes, we're starting with you. Okay. Top um, ten live-action movies, narrative, or documentary starring animals. I don't have any runners-up. If I did have a runner-up, which I actually kind of thought about, mm -hmm. it would have been the giant squid from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. <laughs> um, except for the fact that that movie scared the living crap out of me. <laughs> well, you were young and, when you saw it, too. And that scene with the squid scared the living I've never seen it all the way through. Me. I've Ugh. never seen it all the way through. Freaked me out. Okay. But my number 10, my, my number 10 film is a film that admittedly I haven't watched for a very long time because the first time I saw it, I remember it made me cry and <laughs> I've gotten a lot worse at crying at stuff since then. Mm -hmm. um, it was originally a Japanese film um, and it's from the uh, mid 80s, I think, uh, late 80s. It is called The Adventures of Milo and Otis oh, in good English. God. Um, <laughs> oh, come on. You had to know this would be on my list. Mm. The Adventures of Milo and Otis tells the story of the adventures of Milo, um, who is a uh, kitten, and Otis, who is a uh, pug puppy. And all of the crazy adventures that they go through and all, and the dangerous things that happen and all the, you know, with all the wildlife that they run into, including bears and other things. And, and they wind up both finding, you know, ladies of their species and they wind up starting families. And it's just, it's, uh, it is the cutest damn thing I've ever seen. <laughs> um, it's. Dudley Moore did the voice of both Milo and Otis. There's narration throughout by, by mm -hmm. Dudley Moore in, in America. Um, the narration in Japan was by um, Shigeru Tezuki, I believe is how it was said. Um, it's It was, I just thought it was adorable. I mean, come on. It's a kitten <laughs> and a pug puppy. You'd have to be a Vulcan not to sit there and go, oh. At least once. Spock is not you know, impressed. Because they're so damn cute. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I am, you know, hello, estrogen boobs. I can't help it. I'm a chick. I love cute, fuzzy things. What yes, you, you do. Um, muscle mind. And yet you weren't that enamored with the chicken of tomorrow, which had cute, fuzzy little things in it. Because they kept talking about how they were going to be killed. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> See last week's subject said I'm for, for more on that. Sicko. Anyway. Uh, so my number 10, The Adventures of Milo and Otis. My number 10 is a movie from last year that it really is amazing because the entire film was shot in green screen. You really would not know it looking at how lush and beautiful it is. And it has one human actor and a ton of CGI animals that are so realistic it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, it is so well done and, and really, I think, is the best interpretation of the story so far. And, and it is a brilliant film that makes you fall in love with uh, all the characters in, in it. Uh, my number 10 is 2016's reboot of The Jungle Book, starring Neil Seethi as Mowgli, Mowgli and a, an array of people doing voices, including uh, Ben Kingsley as Bashira. Bagheera, I always get that wrong. Um, Scarlett Johansson as Ka, which was really interesting. I've never heard Ka the snake voiced by a woman before. No, it's very interesting. Especially since Ka in the in the, the stories is male. Is male, and and uh, Bill Murray hilarious as Baloo, of course, the bear. They are all so realistic looking. They don't look like you know. They look like real animals. They do, and and it's and amazing. Idris Elba as Shere Khan. Yeah, Idris yeah. Elba as Shere Khan, and they had a great great amount of of, uh, of people doing great voices for it. And and Neil Seethi, who'd never acted before, really turns in a performance that's amazing. And uh, he will be starring in the sequel, which will be out in 2020, I believe. And before that, there'll be another motion capture version, which Andy Serkis directed, that'll yes. come out in 2019. It's going to be interesting uh -huh. to see the different competing versions. Yeah. But it was really terrific. And um, the the animals are so real, it's scary. Particularly uh, Bagheera, which is a panther, yes. black panther, and gorgeous. I mean, I would have, I, I I don't blame you know. I mean, for having spoken, in, you know, the, the animals speak English, which is not something that animals normally do. But um, they pulled it off brilliantly. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. Done, yeah. Number ten. 2016's version of Disney's The Jungle Book. The I gotta say, I loved that version. It mm -hmm. was really cool. 
it there is one thing that bothered me, which I brought up at the time. Mm-hmm. The fact that um, in the original books, the novel by Rudyard Kipling, mm-hmm. Ka is not an enemy of Mowgli. He actually offers him advice, and he's actually quite nice to mm-hmm. him. In the cartoon and in the live action version, Ka is, you know, duplicitous. And in, and in the original live action version from the 1940s with Sabu as yeah. Mowgli. Yeah, uh, you know, Ka is duplicitous. He tries to eat Mowgli. Which is because he's a snake. Yeah, and I, know, that's I know he's a snake. Put that he's with a it. snake, and, and you have that whole Western. Or she, actually, in the new You have that whole Western Judeo Christian hang up about yeah. snakes. But, you know. It's it, also beautifully animated yeah. in the new one. It's one of those things. Yep. Okay, uh, number nine on my list is actually a film that I have seen quite a number of times um, growing up. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why they ran this. It seemed like they ran at least twice a year, maybe more, on our local, one of our local UHF, UHF stations, uh, back when it was WLVI Channel 56. Um, they had this thing, they would have like a Saturday you know, Saturday afternoon movie or a Sunday afternoon movie. And they ran this film quite a lot. Um, I'd seen it, I've seen it quite a number of times when I was a girl. Um, and I liked it. I thought it was really cool. I really didn't understand the symboliz- symbolism of it until much, much later on. Mm-hmm. But I like it. I mean, and I like this version of it. I think uh-huh. it's really cool. Um, my number nine is from uh, n- 1956, um, Moby Dick, directed mm-hmm. by John Huston, uh, starring uh, Gregory Peck as Captain Ahab, Richard Basehart as Ishmael. You just watched and- it again recently, didn't you? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> You've been watching recently, so many. If yeah. you keep track of your stuff on Letterboxd, you'd know. Um, and, <laughs> you know, way too many other people to bring up. Although I would like to bring up the uh, Orson Welles cameo. Orson Welles appeared as Father Mapple in one scene set in a church. Because if I didn't bring up the Orson Welles scene, he would wing his phone at my head. No, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I didn't even know he was in that, yes. so that's okay. Yes. Um, obviously, the whole story of Moby Dick is the whole, you know, Captain Ahab chasing after the white whale that took his leg and blah, blah, blah. Um you know, the whole idea of the nature of obsession and the destructiveness of obsession and how that, you know, usually whatever you're obsessing about winds up destroying you. We don't see a lot of Moby Dick until mostly through the towards the middle and end of the film. When we do see him, it is scary as Hell. <laughs> I mean, obviously, this is not a real whale. Uh, director John Houston was not going to go out and find himself a real whale and paint it white <laughs> and stick it in a tank. Right. You know, they used miniatures and stuff like that, but it is scary as hell. Um, the whole scene at the end when, and now, that, see, that's one thing that I really always hated my whole life. People always say dumb animal. When they're talking about an animal, they'll call them a dumb animal. Mm-hmm. I hate that term. I know they usually mean dumb as in the animal can't speak. Um, but I really dislike that term. And this film shows that animals are not only not dumb, they can be pretty damn vindictive when they want to be. Because this whale knows that this man is trying to kill it. And this whale is like, come Get me. <laughs> it's it's taunting him. It's daring him to try and kill him. Uh-huh. And there, I mean, there aren't really very many emotional scenes you can film with a whale because <laughs> it's a whale. Yep. You know, you can't get the whole whale in one shot. You know, it's not going to work. Not even if you have, well, maybe if you have CinemaScope. But, um, I mean, there were a lot of close-ups of its eye. And you could tell there was rage, there was calculation, there was, I am going to make you so angry, you're going to slip up. And Mm -hmm. when you slip up, I'm going to get you. And that's what happens. It's, it, I remember watching this, as I said, when I was very young. It never freaked me out to screaming nightmare level, but I was always kind of like, damn, whales are scary. (laughs) As I got older, I found out that, you know, whales are so intelligent and beautiful. I have actually been blessed enough to have gone on a whale watch and 
the whale went up under the boat and like I could if I had leaned out the window just a little more I would have been able to touch it. It mm-hmm. was that close. And it's such an amazing experience. It's almost a religious experience to see something that huge. Mm-hmm. And it real it makes you realize as a person you're really kind of small. Yep. So and that was not the kind of whale that Moby Dick is, which is a sperm whale, which are like, you know, enormous. Right. It's a terrifying movie. If you've never seen it, you really ought to. Um, my number nine, Moby Dick. <laughs> my number nine is a film that I first saw when I was in fourth grade. When, I, when we, where I went to school in fourth grade, once a week or so, when when everybody had their schoolwork done and classes done, they would give us a treat by showing us a a film. They would get a sixteen millimeter copy and show it. I mean, it was like an hour and a half long movie that they would show it in in the AV room for each class and and. I always thought that was neat. And I saw this for the first time when I was in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. I had very fond memories of it. And I was like, do I want to see it again when it was on the Disney Channel back in the 80s? And I and this is when the Disney Channel was still a pay network like HBO or Showtime or one of those. And I remember I'm like, yes, I want to see it again. And I sat there and watched it again and was just remembering my fourth grade experience and still loving it. Um, at the time, even though uh, if you go through this movie and see it and don't break out in tears at some point, you're a Vulcan, like you always said. My number nine is 1961's Grey Friars Bobby, A True Story. Um, it is. A, I don't know how true it is. I'm assuming it's an apocryphal story about a dog who goes to town with his master. His master dies of pneumonia and... No matter what happens, he won't, he refuses to be adopted by his master's friends. Whenever he'd go home with them, he'd trek back to the graveyard where his master is buried and, and sleep on his master's grave mm-hmm. every night until he died. Um, I mean, he would go miles out of, out into the countryside and he would find his way back before morning to the, to the gravesite. Mm-hmm. It's so sad and so wonderfully, um, Loyal shows how loyal the the dog was. He was a sky terrier in in the original movie, and and it's just it's it, it'll get to you. Oh, You've yeah. seen oh, it, absolutely. right? No, I've actually never seen Grey Friars, Bobby. I know I know <laughs> the story. I've 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 heard the story of, yeah. of Grey Friars, Bobby, but mm-hmm. I've never seen the film because I would probably cry myself into an episode. You would. So my you number know. nine is two thousand uh, nineteen sixty one's Grey Friars, Bobby. If you've never seen it, I'm sure it'll be around. And if it's not around now, just wait a year. And when Disney launches their streaming service, it'll be there too. Yeah. It's not like they've never done pay TV before. That's basically what the Disney Channel used to be. So everybody freaking out about this channel is is kind of overreacting. Yeah. I mean, if I know a movie is going to make me cry till I throw up, I do try to, <laughs> I tend to avoid that. Um, but seeing as how certain things make me cry, you know. And speaking of that, that brings me to number eight on my list. Again, this is more special effects than actual apes, which is, which is what we're talking about in the film. Uh, mm-hmm. My number eight is Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes. Oh, yeah, you asked me yeah. about that. See, I've never seen that. Um, group, so. Oh, my gosh, you're missing something. That mm-hmm. is an incredible film. Um, Christopher Lambert as John Clayton, or Tarzan, Lord of the Apes, a, a young man that is whose parents and he are shipwrecked. And, well, when they get shipwrecked, the, his mom is pregnant with him. And she gives birth on this island and, you know, this jungle area with, with her husband and they wind up getting killed. And the, the little baby is, um, found by some apes. And one of the apes is, uh, a female named Kala, um, who is carrying the body of her dead child. And when she finds Ta- John, he, she takes him with her and he winds up being part of this gorilla family. You know, fast forward, he grows up as a as, you know, a member of this family and then the whole civilization thing rears its ugly head. And at one point and I remember this so clearly and I remember bawling my eyes out, um when he's in London with um the woman that he loves, Jane Porter, um, he 
sees all these displays of, of animals that have been shot and, you know, stuffed and put on display and stuff like that, which naturally freaks him the hell out. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't blame him. Um, and he finds also that there's this one part of this exhibit that they have live animals, including apes from Africa, one of which is an ape called Silverbeard, who was the his adoptive father in the in the ape clan Mm -hmm. um he he breaks the cages open and frees all the the animals um and they're they wind up getting chased by the police and the people from the museum and they get to a park and silverbeard winds up being shot and dies as as tarzan's cradling him and it just oh Mm -hmm. i just cried and cried and cried and probably made an ass of myself in the theater. I don't well, care. That's something you're good at. Um, it, I'm sorry. It broke my heart. <laughs> it was so incredibly That's not the only moving. way you do that, though. What? Make an ass of yourself in the theater. You do it in so many ways. I love you, too. Dark Knight Rises. All right. All right. Well anyway. I'm a woman. I have needs. <laughs> don't judge me. Anyway, the thing is, when you see this film, you're going, oh my gosh, it's so amazing. How did they get these animals to do this? And then you find out those aren't animals. Those are people in suits. Um, So they must have been really good looking for you to to fall for it because you usually hate that. I I usually do hate that. Uh, But, well, yeah, I mean, the, the makeup work, the puppeteering that was done was so incredibly unbelievable you honest to goodness thought those were real animals Mm -hmm. um it's and it's so beautiful and so moving and so intensely sad in certain parts but like it's such an amazing film if you've never seen Greystoke I definitely recommend it um my number eight Greystoke the legend of Tarzan lord of the apes great my number eight is the film that defined the term blockbuster. Um, and then that, uh, the book came out in 1974, blew everybody's mind. And by 1975, it was being made into a motion picture that would be a record setter for the number of attendance, the amount of money it made, the amount it went over budget during production. And it would make stars of the people that were in the film that weren't already stars. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is truly one of the most terrifying films you've ever seen. The first time you see it, you, if you don't know what you're going in for, it's going to be pretty damn scary. Oh, yeah. When you have seen it, you know what's coming. But it's, it's still, still fun. Scary. It's still mm-hmm. scary and fun. Number eight on my list, 1975's Jaws. Anybody who knows uh, the story of Jaws knows that it's about... Brucey, the great white shark terrorizing Amity Island, the fictional name of the, which was actually shot off Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Sheriff Martin Brody, played by uh, Roy Scheider, uh, is is trying to keep the beaches safe during the 4th of July and leading up to 4th of July while the people who run the town council are kind of giving him crap about it. He hires an expert in, in the... Uh, what is that called? Uh, oceanographer mm-hmm. to come in and take a look at the uh, Ex- what the situation. Ex- ichthyology. Is I he? Think. Is he? Was he? Was was Cooper Hooper a, a, an uh, ichthyologist? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Somebody who knows fish and and under undersea animals, and also um, Captain Quint, played terrifyingly by Robert Shaw. One of the best roles I've ever seen him in. Mm-hmm. Um, we just watched it again, most of it, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Yep. It's 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 a movie you can't get sick of because it's just so well done. Brucey looks a little bit fake by today's standards, but well, it, it, yeah. it's an amazing film. And John Williams' score will set your hair on edge. Mm-hmm. Brilliant score. Um, it's just one of the all-time great animal films. Number eight, Jaws, from 1975. Okay. Uh, number... Uh, eight on, I'm sorry, number seven on my list is my first foray into documentaries. Um, it is a very strange thing to do a documentary about. And I'll be the first to admit this because if you told, if you asked me what would be a good subject for a documentary, you know, I What could, would be a good subject for a documentary? I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> 
Hey, you know, I, I, I make my cues. You know, you could you could talk about all sorts of different things. You know, film styles. You know, art, music, dance. What you know? I mean, medicine. You know, military stuff. Anything you want. The one word that would not come to your mind right away: chickens. Uh, my number, <laughs> my number seven film is a documentary from 2016 called Chicken People. Oh my god! Really? Now, before anybody thinks this is some twisted, wow. some twisted sci-fi movie, it isn't. Chicken we people. just reran the review last week on Subject Cinema. Yeah. As you're listening to this, it was uh, part of our uh, mostly chicken show. Yeah. Yep. Um, chicken People is looking at people who raise. Poultry, not just chickens. There's other. You but know, mo- the focus is mostly mostly chicken, chickens. But there yes, are but there, other but there, poultry, are, yeah. there were other things seen Turkey, like ducks geese and, and geese, geese and yep. stuff like basically anything you know that's on a farm, of which I would know very little because I've been on a farm like maybe five <laughs> times in my life. It is a really fascinating film because you might think that looking at something like this, all these people are going to be weird. Like, really weird. Not like good weird, like me and him. Like, bad weird. Um, <laughs> but you know what? These people are really nice. Mm-hmm. They're all really nice people, and they're really passionate about this whole... Now, when I say... Sh- what they're doing is they're breeding birds to show them. They have shows, just like there are dog shows and yeah. cat shows yeah. and bunny rabbit shows and stuff like that. And I don't know if there are reptile shows, but there might be. Um... People, you know, raise certain breeds of chickens, and they are birds, and they bring them to this one place, and, you know, people are judged on specific breeds of chickens and how they look and how they're supposed to look according to this one rule book about how the chickens are supposed to look, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I realize that some people might be like, it's chickens, who cares? (laughs) But... I have to, and I have to be honest, and and I am kind of ashamed of myself. I have to put myself in that category um, before I saw this film, because and which is weird because I am. I like to think I'm kind of. You She's know, had a traumatic experience with chickens. I got bit by a chicken once. Pecked. I got pecked by a chicken once. It hurt <laughs> and it bled. Damn chicken attacked me for no damn reason. I've been pecked by uh, chickens too, and they never. It didn't. I mean, it stung, but it didn't do that much damage. Well, it mine bled. It got me right in the tip of my finger. Oh, mine got me in the hand. But my my whole point is, I like to think of myself as an animal person. I I love animals, even animals that other people are like, ew, gross, get it away. But and when I heard about this film, I was like, they're chickens. Who cares? And then we watched it, and I was like. Wow, I've never seen a chicken that looked like that or that or that or oh wow, that chicken's really pretty. It's got really pretty feathers and that looks really cool. You know, this this film opened my mind up to all of these different varieties of chickens and how serious people are about <laughs> breeding they chickens. Are, yeah. They're just as serious about breeding chickens that are mm. supposed to look a certain way and all that stuff like that as people who breed dogs to show them at Westminster mm. where the dogs have to, you know, be a certain color and they right. have to have certain features and blah, blah, blah. It's It was really interesting. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it and I, and I learned something. Yep. And it, it opened my eyes and broadened my horizons, which is always a good thing. So my number seven, <laughs> chicken people. My number seven is, I, again, it was an older movie that I saw for the first time in my 20s on the Disney Channel. I remember seeing it come out over and over again because Disney in the 60s and 70s re-released their films every three or four years. Um, because that was just the way it was done. Um, when I saw this, I was like, wow, I've always heard about this. I wonder if it'll keep my interest. Well, it did. They've remade it, um, in the 1990s, uh, using voices for the animals. And I just didn't really think that was necessary. What I've seen of that one, I wasn't that enamored with. Mm -hmm. But the original one is, is truly a lot of fun, pretty scary in places. And features three of the dumbest, or not dumbest, but odd named animals I've ever seen. The film is 1963's The Incredible Journey from, mm-hmm. from, uh, from uh, Disney. In the film, family goes on vacation but loses their three pets. Two dogs, Luath, Luath? Mm. Bodger, and their cat, Tal. And um, the, the animals are all friendly with each other. 
And so when they get left off, they start trekking, trying to find home. And there's a few pretty dicey things in the forest, but they eventually, spoiler alert, are reunited with their family Mm -hmm. about a week later. Um, Bodger, I believe, is a pit bull. Uh, Luath, it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, I think was an Irish setter or a golden retriever or a cross between them. And Tao is a Siamese cat who also ended up playing uh, DC and that darn cat a couple years later. Mm-hmm. The same cat. Um, it, it's, it only has a little bit of human interaction uh, with a hunter and his wife that, that help when one of the dogs gets a porcupine quill stuck in its in its face and uh, but it's it's a it's it's photography of the areas where it was shot in Canada and Washington State is absolutely beautiful and and in the the animals act like animals. I mean right. they're trained and they obviously are doing stuff that they normally probably would not do, but it's really well done and well put together. And and I thought it was a lot of fun when I was in my twenties and watching it. And I understand why kids of all generations like to uh 1963's The Incredible Journey, my number seven. Okay. <clears throat> uh number six on my list is a really underseen film. I, I don't know why this film didn't do very I mean it did okay at the box office, but it I mean it made its money back, but it's one of these films that, for some reason, people just kind of like, okay, it came out, and, you know, that was about it. <laughs> okay. Which I don't understand, because I really, really liked it. I thought it was really cool. And it was really beautiful. It had a beautiful story. My number six from uh, 2010, Secretariat. Uh, telling the story of not only Secretariat, the horse that... Uh, you know, was, I mean, they called him Super Horse for a reason, you know, I mean. <laughs> they sure did. Seriously, if if horses, if you could compare a horse to a superhero, comparing this horse to Superman is not really all that off, because the things <laughs> this horse could do and the stamina this horse had were were not things that you found in your average Horse. I mean, I don't know very much about horses. I'll be perfectly honest and say I don't, yep. which is really bad because my family has racing stuff in the background and I probably should know more than I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also the story of uh, Penny Penny Chenery, who is a lady who takes over the farm that her father owned, uh, Meadow Stables, which was located in Doswell, Virginia, Despite the fact that when she takes over the farm, she doesn't really know all that much about horse racing. And she's living like 2,000 miles away out of, in Denver with her husband and yeah. four kids. <laughs> she winds up, um, through, through a coin flip, winds up having one of the, um, the foals between her and another farm. And this horse became something incredibly special. Mm-hmm. Um, when you see Secretariat, and the cool thing about Secretariat is that they used the actual footage from the 60s. 70s. Um, from the 70s, I should say. I'm sorry. From the 70s when, the, when these races were going on, the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont and the Preakness. The, Pre- the Preakness. So that's really neat because we see people watching it on TV and stuff like that. And it's got that 70s feel Mm -hmm. to it, you know. And it's really, really Mm. cool. And Diane Lane was so incredibly inspiring as Penny Chenery, who was basically going up against the male-dominated field of horse racing and going, yeah, okay, that's nice. Watch us. Watch what we can do. She never lost faith in Secretariat. Nope. And... He came through on that faith. He was, I mean, people are always like, oh, animals don't really understand what people feel and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. No. I never believe that. Mm-mm. I know that Secretary knew what he was doing was important. Yeah. You could tell by the And he body. liked it. Yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say. You could tell from the body language of the horse that he was like, yes, I won. Yes, I'm awesome. Yes, you can keep heaping praise on me. That's fine. You know, there's an old saying about don't, you know, don't let your mouth cash a check, you know, write a check that your ass can't catch. Mm-hmm. That horse may not could have been cash able to, any check it wanted. Yeah, might not have been able to talk, but he could run and his ass could definitely cash that check. 
Um, it's a beautiful movie. The ending never fails to make me tear up. Mm-hmm. Um, beautiful mu- use of music in that film. Um, the soundtrack of which has never been released, and I don't understand why. It's mm-hmm. a great score. Um, if you can get back, if you can get past John Malkovich's wardrobe choices, oh god, he's hilarious. As trainer Lucy and Lauren, it is the seventies, <laughs> so there's that. Um, a lot of plaid. Mm, um, yes, too my, much no, my number six, Secretariat, amazing film and about an amazing animal and a very amazing lady. Mm-hmm. Number six, huh? Okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> number six on my list. Now we each have, from our, both of our perspectives, a favorite Hitchcock film that the other has never seen. Yes. I have never seen Psycho. I'm going to be seeing it shortly because we want to review that new documentary out about the shower scene. Mm-hmm. When are you going to watch The Birds with me? Uh, whenever you want. <laughs> I mean, I'll I'll sit there and be nervous, but I'll I watch haven't it. seen The Birds in a long time, but I've seen it so many times over my life. It when was, I was not younger. my choice originally. I know. Not to I, see well, it. I wasn't either. When I was very little, my mom and my stepdad <clears throat> wanted to watch it when it was premiering on TV, and mom's like, <clears throat> "This is very scary. You can't come in the room. You've got to promise me you'll stay in the other room." And I said, "Okay." And she laid out my snacks and stuff and toys. And I stayed there and I could hear them talking and I didn't pay any attention to them. So when I finally saw it a few years later, I was like, wow, this is really good. Oh, sh- dang. That's the, yeah. Ooh, okay. Ah, okay. Now I know why she doesn't want me in the room when I was five. Um, the story is just bizarre. It's a, a small seaside town in California that suddenly is besieged by attacking birds with no rhyme or reason ever given in the film. Um, and they've been talking about making a remake of it for years. It's never come to pass until this year. The BBC is currently in production on a TV miniseries remake of it mm-hmm. set in Cornwall. Um, I, I don't know when it'll premiere on BBC America or PBS. I don't think PBS will be carrying it. It's just a subject matter. It just says this does not scream PBS to me. Mm. Tippi Hedren uh, and Rod Taylor are the stars. I was a fan of both of them. Um, I loved Rod Taylor and other stuff. He did a lot of Disney voiceover work, also did stuff in the 70s and 80s. Um, and, and it was because I had seen him in The Birds that I just always watched. And He was a terrific actor who had no problem getting rid of his Australian accent <clears throat> for doing American or English or whatever he did. And, and he, was, he was really great. The Birds itself is pretty terrifying, especially in the main attack sequence. And you look real carefully, you'll find Morgan Brittany, who later went on to be a big star on Dallas in the 1970s and mm-hmm. 80s. Um, but it's seriously one of Hitchcock's greatest films. Yeah. And many critics have said in more recent years that it is definitely probably his second greatest film after Psycho. Mm-hmm. And then uh, even above Rebecca, which won the best picture. Right. So it's like, wow, that's something. Number six on my list, 1963's. Alfred Hitchcock classic, The Birds. Yeah. See, I went through the same thing with that in the fact that my mother was like, you're not watching this. You know? <laughs> I, I think it was more because she knew, even as a child, you I You take was, the bird side. Yeah. 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 Even though you didn't know why. Um, well, that, well, she also knew... You would have become an evil bird lady. You would have been out in the backyard attracting birds. We're going to go attack people. Attack! <laughs> uh, I refuse to say anything on the grounds that it might incriminate me <laughs> at some point. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Um, <coughs> actually, I think my mom was more concerned about the fact that there are there are several scenes where the birds are like basically doing a kamikaze yeah, attack. Yeah. I think she was more worried that I would sit there and freak out and cry and be like, oh my gosh, those birds got hurt and stuff like right. that. Right. So. And if you've never seen The Birds, don't forget to check out its tribute, Birdemic, from James Ewan from 2010. call it a tribute. We'll just, we'll, <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. Um, okay. Um, number five on my list is on my list because it's a very important film. Because it is a very important film does not mean it is an easy film to watch. It is not. Mm -hmm. I will be the first to admit it. Um, You mentioned before the the, the number of times I have made a spectacle of myself. Oh, yes. (laughs) In theaters. And, you know, on more than one occasion, I have been... She scares little kids. No, this isn't that. <laughs> oh, it's not. Okay. Uh, no, and um, on more than one occasion, by certain people in this room, 
pointing at you. <laughs> I have been accused of being melodramatic, etc., blah, blah. Your mother started that. Yeah. <laughs> I blame you, Mom. So, anyway. Um... This was one time. This was not melodrama. None of the okay. none of the emotions that that I gave out gave voice to right. in the theater were not, were done for attention. This was right. real. Okay. Um, my number five is uh, 2011's Project Nim. Oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah. Project oh, Nim. Yeah. God, we, don't Herb Terrace never come around us. Uh, Project mm. Nim is a documentary about a. a Experiment, a social experiment that was performed in the 1970s with a chimp named Nim. The whole idea of this experiment was that a baby chimp was taken from its mother and given to a human family and raised as a human child to see if raising a primate like a human being they would be able to teach it sign language and basically teach it to be a human. Why in the hell you would want to do this, I have absolutely no idea. Only Dr. Herbert Terrace knows that answer. And as I've said a number of times after seeing Project Nim, if Herb Terrace ever comes within five feet of me, I'm going to punch, his, punch him in the face because he's a gas bag. He's, he's being figurative about that. I'd like to bring that up. You um, think so, huh? Let's not. Let's just be good and not try it. Hmm. How's that? What was done to this animal in the name of science was absolutely hideous and cruel and beyond cruel. I don't know what words. It just it was evil. Mm. I mean, you know, that's just my own opinion. I don't care. There was a point in this film where I was crying to a point of almost hyperventilation. We were at the we were at the Boston and uh Boston IFFB and mm-hmm. Penny Film Festival Boston. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We knew it was one that we had wanted to see the entire time. This was one of the times when Sundance was right. It was a powerful gut wrenching film. Yeah. And yeah, you you were scaring some people around us pretty badly. You were hyperventilating or coming close to it. So uh, Yeah, but it was it was weird though. It was it wasn't crying out of sorrow. It was crying out of rage. Yeah, I know. I, I was crying. And this, for this happens even well after yeah, that whole thing I ended. Was and what happened? I was crying for this them. beautiful, innocent animal and what it was going through. And it just that was how it came out of me was tears because mm-hmm. the only other way it would have come out would have been screaming obscenities <laughs> at the top of my lungs. I can, I can, I can attest to that. That wouldn't have gone over very no, well. No, I don't think so. I was about two heartbeats away of going, from going Super Saiyan in the theater as it was. I know. You know, it is a powerful film. It is a disturbing film. It goes to show that human beings like to call ourselves the most evolved creatures on this planet. Ha! That is a that, my friends, is a big fat lie. Mm-hmm. It is a big fat lie because mm-hmm. we have not evolved beyond cruelty, mm-hmm. and until that happens, we can't call ourselves the most evolved on this planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, number five, Project Nim. I, I, I didn't. I would never. You put that on several of your lists, and I, oh, it always surprises me because you had that visceral reaction, and yet I, I know it stuck with you, I, and yeah. that's why. Uh, well, yeah, because it's so it lodges in your heart once you see it. You know, mm-hmm. it's just it's just that way. I don't like the way number five is always referred to when I see it online as a children's film because it's not. It's a family film. It's not a children's film. In fact, I would not want children to see it alone because there's some pretty scary things in it. Okay. But this is, of all the movies they did um, over the over the course of about 15 years with this animal, um, uh, this was my favorite. And it's odd because and it was also the critics' favorite, which is interesting. Um, and it's the only one that didn't have a plot as far as it was more of like a, an old time Disney documentary style. Mm-hmm. There was a plot to the movie. It was a fictional film. But 1987's Benji the Hunted was absolutely amazing to look at. In the film, Benji is, lo- is lost at sea after an accident on the boat that he's riding with his owner, Frank in to an appearance somewhere. And he's Benji, the superstar dog that starred in all these other films. 
he ends up lost in the wilderness and ends up becoming a sort of caretaker for four orphaned cougar cubs who were uh, whose mother was shot by a hunter who does show up at points in the film, the only human in the film except for the beginning and the end. Um, and he's trying to get these four cougars, uh, cubs, to be adopted by another cougar mother and her son. Mm-hmm. Um, it. My mother and I went to this. Mom was like, oh, I'm never going to like this film. You know, it's, it's just going to bore me. We were both bawling by the end of this film. Mm-hmm. It, it's beautiful and it's scary and it's it's photography is amazing the cinematography is just beautiful and and benji as a whole was a franchise in the 70s and 80s that did well the benji the first movie was a lot of fun they're remaking it now supposedly um and and it was it was you know a family film the sequels were kind of the for the love of benji wasn't that good and stay far away from oh heavenly dog with chevy chase that movie sucked but This one is just brilliant in its simplicity. There's no dialogue in the film except for the very beginning, the very ending, and a couple of lines from The Hunter. Mm -hmm. The rest is all simply nature, Benji, the Cougars, and some spectacular cinematography. My number five, 1987's Benji the Hunted. Okay, that's a good choice. Um, Number four on my list is another documentary. Uh, it's amazing how many of these are documentaries. Um, <clears throat> Not really. This is a really terrific film that everybody knows. I mean, it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary, and mm-hmm. it's one of those films that I, you know, everybody's heard of it, and it's you know just one of those kind of films. Uh, from uh, 2005, March of the Penguins. What number? Uh, um, number four. My number four is March of the Penguins. Also. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> This is such an incredible film because, how, for one thing, when you see the words narrated by Morgan Freeman, you really can't go wrong after that. <laughs> Although I this mean, was the know, first thing that people really listened to him as a narrator. Yeah, and, and, and finally noticed, and it's oh, like, my oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, Easy he, Reader has he, grown up. He's done that too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he's not going around doing the whole Easy Reader patter from, from, from the 1970s. He's He's established himself as the distinguished gentleman actor that he is. Yes, that's true. And you just showed you're old. I did. Um, I did. But it's... It really is an incredible film because when you see penguins at the zoo or at the aquarium... or the aquarium. You know, you know, places like that. Boston's Aquarium, it's obvious, awesome. They have all kinds of penguins. Yeah, the problem with... See, that's... <laughs> the, 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 the Boston Aquarium, the New England Aquarium... Have a penguin exhibit that is really cool. It takes a, it's it's part of the entire first floor. It's awesome. And if you sit there and tell yourself, "Well, I'm going to watch them for a minute," you'll be two, there for hours. You'll be there all damn day. They'll be like, "We're closing now." They but have rock here, hoppers you know. and a couple of other different types, and yeah. they're all over the pools. I don't and think just... they have any emperor penguins, which is what no, this is about. No, but um, they have the, some of the other ones that mm-hmm. we've seen in other movies. A documentary looking at the birthing cycle of a not a one specific penguin but like a penguin colony Mm -hmm. we go from when they first you know hit land and they meet each other and then they have a baby well they have an egg and then they have a baby right um and then when the babies are old enough to go out into the world and probably never see their parents again and the parents will separate and never see each other again and all this kind of stuff like that because most birds are like that uh, except for swans, I think. Swans made for life. I thought penguins um, made it for life, too, but I guess that's I not guess true. I guess they don't. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are a lot of really... I I know some people are going to be like, ah, but I don't care. Um, there are a lot of really adorable scenes in this film. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Baby emperor penguin... Emperor penguin chicks are so effing cute, it defies logic. How cute these things are. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're these well, little... Well, they're little adorable balls of fluff. Yeah, they're little gray balls of floofy adorableness. <laughs> and you just want to grab one and be like, mine! You know, but the thing is, because this is a documentary, you know, you get into very real situations, including... Another incident trigger. Oh, we're going to get there in a second. <laughs> you know, in the fact that, you know, these these are animals, they're in the wild, and there are other things in the wild that have to eat, too. Yeah. And one of the things that leopard seals eat is penguins. And 
That ain't what I'm talking about. You know it. I know. I know. <laughs> but this film also proves my point. Point that I've made several times, and we talked about on one of the shows we did earlier on. In Every Cinema. film has to have a Every villain. film yeah. has to have an antagonist. Even, even documentaries, yeah. Yes, even documentaries. Because you and I both know that at that moment, that is nature acting out what nature does every day, predator right. and prey. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, for that one moment, you're pissed off at that seal. Yeah, oh yeah. Because that was a cute little friendly penguin, and now it just got its head bit off. Yeah. And you're mad at that seal. You're not going, <laughs> well, you know, that's nature's way, you know. No, 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 you're pissed. <laughs> and that's a human reaction. Yeah. It's also a human reaction to cry when something really sad happens and when a little penguin chick um perishes be i think it's because of exposure to yeah, the elements yeah it's and, well, severely and, cold yeah it's i mean this is the antarctic you right. know it's not you know right we're not talking you know miami in the middle of july no um and this poor little carcass is lying there on the ice and the mother penguin is Wailing. I mean, there's no other word yep. for it, and it's it is so heartbreakingly sad. Mm -hmm. And yes, I flipped out in the theater. You know what? I'm not sorry. I did. You know, I no, don't but care. You, you've got to be careful when you do that. You scared a couple of little girls to death. There were two girls and her mother sitting two rows in front of us, and Kim is literally almost hyperventilating. And these little girls are freaking out because they didn't. They've never seen that before. Well, I didn't, you know, I know. I'm sorry if I scared anybody. But I know you didn't mean to. I did. You. I definitely it's, it's didn't your, mean to. It's your wonderfully golden heart that, that gets to them, gets you. Aww. It's a really beautiful film, and it makes you realize that there are parts of this planet that we really need to take care of mm -hmm. better because this is the only one we're going to get mm -hmm. planet-wise. Yep. This is it. You know, and these animals, well, and these animals are part of our, you know, the, you know, ecosystem, ecosystem, but not, not more important than that. You know, we talk about how all the achievements we do and all the stuff we do as a species and look how special we are, you know, but we need to take better care of the planet because we have to be its caretakers for as long as we're here. Mm -hmm. You know, that includes, like, not blowing it up. That right. would be nice. Right. Um, but, you know, my whole thing is when I, ha when I have a bad day, if I'm, like, in a really bad place, I will go find myself a picture of a baby penguin. <laughs> she does, will, too. And then she sends them to me. And then I will feel better. <laughs> And I realize it's Although it's pretty much baby anything. You can you, you have these all these she subscribes to all these cute photo things and yes, it's I like, do. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, it's cheaper than a martini in the long run. It is. So, um my number four, March of the Penguins. My number four is March of the Penguins because not just because of all the things that Kim said. Um the cinematography on this, I feel so sorry for the crew that had to be there for a year shooting this in the depth of the absolutely harshest winter Antarctic had seen in mm -hmm. over 40 years. Yeah, because, of course. They ended because up, that's uh, the way stuff yeah, works out. That's how it was. <laughs> um, Alex, Alex Werman's incredible score for this film mm -hmm. is just so listenable and, and so beautiful with the, with, I, I believe it's an oboe that does that, that distinctive note mm -hmm. that everybody knows from the commercials and, and the piano. And I love, the score, the cinematography is beautiful, and 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 you know having Morgan Freeman narrate this is just gravy. I mean, it like you said that distinguished you know godlike voice that yeah. he has become known for. The um, thing you mentioned, the filming and stuff, that was one of the coolest things. Is the fact that usually when you know you have film crews filming wild animals and stuff, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll freak. And they'll fly you know, away. These or penguins run away. come right up to the camera. Yeah, they the, don't the care. penguins are just kind of like, "Hey, what's up?" Yeah, you know. And I'm like, I wish I could. You're have foolish that. enough to be here in in 60 degree under below zero weather. Fine, that's fine. It's like I have to this be here. This is my good side. Yeah, it's like I have to be here. I'm a penguin. What's your excuse? <laughs> it's really hilarious. There's a, there's a couple yeah. of great behind the scenes documentaries yeah. with the DVD. If you've never seen it, check that's it out. Too funny Number that four, we tied that. March of the Penguins from 2005. Okay. Um, so that's me again? Yep. All right. Um, my number three is a film that you've already mentioned. I can't believe it was so low on your list, but whatever. Um, my number three is Jaws. Woo! 
Um, one of the first summer blockbusters, or it is the- considered the summer mm-hmm. original summer blockbuster. Yeah, before Jaws movies were blockbusters were released throughout the year. Right, Jaws was the the originator of the summer movie season. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Damn you, film, Spielberg, anyway. A film that I did not see when it originally came out because I, I saw was, about 15 minutes of it when it came out. I was an incredibly small <laughs> child, <laughs> so and my parents I. were like, no <laughs> way in hell we're taking you to that. Um, probably also because we do live on the water, and they were probably like, she'll never go near the beach again if we take yeah. her to this movie. Yeah. And they would have been right. Yeah, they would have um, been. Actually, knowing me, I would have been standing out there going, "Here, sharky, 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 sharky." You know, that's just no. Me. Even you are not that, not that idiotic. You would Thank have, you? Kno- you would have known better than to do that. Well, yeah, I know. It is. I mean, like you mentioned, the the special effects now, especially with the shark, are a little bit. You know, I mean, they're dated, but they're, they're dated. still well done. They're dated, but they're still scary as yeah, hell. Yeah. I mean, the one scene when we finally see the sharks. Head up till this point right. in the film, we have not seen the shark's head. Um, when Brody's chum in the water, which is for those of you who don't know what that means, is throwing animal guts and things into the water to attract sharks, and it worked. Yeah. Um, because oh yeah, it worked. This, you know, huge head comes out of the water with the mouth open wide enough that it looks like a person could fall into it whole. Um, it's it is scary as. Hell, if you don't know it's coming, I'm sure more than one person peed their pants in the theater. Um, there's a line that um, that Quint says when they're talking about they're having drinks and getting trashed in the boat, and they're talking about sharks, and he's talking about how um, sharks have black eyes uh, like a doll's eyes, they're lifeless eyes like a doll's eyes, that they almost don't seem like they're real mm-hmm. until he bites you. And then those eyes roll back white. And it's really terrifying because when you look at a shark's eyes, they they are that black depth. You you, you feel mm-hmm. like you could fall into them. They're so dark. And it's real. I mean, the whole scene at the end when the, sh- when the shark attacks the boat, a lot of people are like, that's not how a shark would normally react. And I have to be honest... I don't, I don't really think that's how a shark would react. I don't know. I really don't know if it, I thought the whole thing about a shark launching itself into the air to get on the boat mm-hmm. was stupid. I was like, a shark can never do that. Well, guess what? They Great can. whites can do that. Yeah. Great whites can jump up out of the water and, and it's not, that's a, that's horrifying. Mm-hmm. It is really horrifying when you see a real great white shark do that. Uh, it is a scary film. Uh, it is really, really something special, though. Um, if I can't believe anybody out there hasn't seen it. The sequels go progressively downhill. Um, <laughs> Jaws 2 isn't too bad. The other two are terrible. Well, Jaws 2 isn't too... Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not terrible. The ending is stupid. Yeah, the ending is stupid. And Jaws 3 and Jaws the Revenge, please don't waste your time. Um, but my number three film uh, with live-action animal... Uh, although in this case it was a mechanical one. Yeah. Uh, Jaws. My number three is a movie that, um, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to, because it's terrific. And um, it's it, it's an amazing story, a story that goes back thousands of years. And just really, to, 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 to see what we've seen in this film, um, it it is breathtaking. I mean, just... To know that this has been going on for literally centuries is just, to me, an amazing thing. It never made me wanted to go over there to visit ever before, until now. Mm-hmm. And and it introduces you to a wonderful cast of characters that include Bingu, Denise, Duman, Gamels, Aslan Perkazi, Psychopat, and Surrey. Mm-hmm. It is this year's marvelous movie that is probably going to be in the big running for my best documentary this year, the wonderful Turkish cat film, Keddy. Mm-hmm. Keddy is just out on DVD this week. If you haven't seen it, you need to rent it. It is a charming story about the cats of Istanbul. Um, shot by first-time director, uh, let me get her name here, um, Seda, 
Uh, stupid thing went away. Uh, <laughs> uh, first time director, Seda Torin, who was nominated for several awards at, and the film actually won two recent awards at the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards. It's shot mostly at street level with special cameras that have been made for it. And, and it focuses, although that's seen, there's 20 or 30 cats in the film. Those are the primary seven that are the, the stars of it. Um, and they each have their own story. They have mm-hmm. their own families in some cases, or they're, they're loners or mousers. But they live as semi-feral cats on the streets of Istanbul. Yep. Um, and the, ta- the cats of Istanbul go back to the, way back in time, thousands of years. And they have always roamed the streets freely, and the residents love them for the most part. They, yeah. Some of them are very well cared for, a, a semi-feral state by, by humans that leave them food or help them out. I mean, you've got one of them, I think that was Dennis, that actually comes to a certain restaurant every day, doesn't bother them, he just waits on a little stool they have out front for him, and they bring him out the food that he likes. They mm-hmm. know what he likes. And he sits there and eats it and leaves. And that, it's not a big... No, he's not begging it at the table. It, he's it's, not bothering It's beautifully people. charming and had us both in tears at a couple of places. And and it's just an amazing film that if uh, if you've not seen it, um, it actually probably will... Um, you can see it online. It's been on YouTube Red since June, and you can definitely check it out now that it's out on DVD. If it's not at your Red Box, local Red Box, go online and get them to order it because it's it's an oscilloscope film, which are usually low. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't find them that easily, but it is. Um, it's truly heartwarming. You'll sit there and you'll have a great big smile on your face. Ninety percent of this movie, watching the antics of these wonderful cats. Psychopath will scare the crap out of you, <laughs> um, and and the other ones are just going to charm your socks off. And I urge everybody to check out 2017's Keddy, my number three live action film of all time with animals. Okay. Um, number two on my list, I know is on your list. I'm just trying to figure out where on your list. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a beautiful, moving film that the fact that it is a true story makes it all the more incredible. We tie it again. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Um, my number two is A Street Cat Named Bob. My number two is A Street Cat Named Bob oh from my 2016. Gosh, that is a- Scream. <laughs> um, the story of a recovering addict, a man named James Bowen, he, um, he was living on the streets and also living with addiction as, as a heroin addict. Um, he is basically got one more shot left at trying to get his life in order. Um, he's off of drugs and he has a place to live, but he needs to, you know, make money. To, to support himself and to also keep from getting back into falling into a, a, a habit that could kill him. Mm-hmm. And when he stays in his new place, he has a visitor that he doesn't expect in the form of a yellow and orange... Uh, ginger. Or, yeah, ginger, a ginger cat who just kind of shows up and is kind of like, oh, this is your place, nice. Hungry, I'm and, hungry. Yeah, and he <laughs> thinks the cat must belong to somebody, and the cat's like, yeah, I belong to you. Um, <laughs> and thus begins an amazing story of the incredibly moving and tender friendship that develops between James and the cat that he names Bob, and it just, it completely warms your heart. It will bring a tear to your eye if you don't flat out start bawling, mm-hmm. which I did numerous times. Yes, don't judge me, me too. Um, <laughs> it is proof that angels don't need wings and halos or trench coats. Mm-hmm. Shout out to my Supernatural fans. Yeah. Um, that an angel can have uh, four feet and a tail. Mm-hmm. It's a amazing amazing film number two on my list and on your list Mm -hmm. a street cat named bob luke treadaway stars as james bowen in this film and he just makes it his own i've liked him for a long time i mean i first really saw him in attack the block and i've seen him in a number of other things but as james he really captures james story and james has taken 
He, a street cat named Bob was James' book he wrote with a, a writer on one of the London papers. Mm-hmm. When he was making his living for the longest time as a busker and would bring Bob along, Bob would sit on his shoulders while he played or at his feet. And then later on, he began distributing this uh, paper that is used to help raise money for the homeless. And um, all the while, um, people were learning more about him. People, He was drawing in more and more of a crowd, and eventually his story became well-known. And he's now been clean for a number of years. Bob's still at his side, and Bob is a folk hero in Britain. This is the subject of three books James has now written, along with four children's books about him. This this movie is beautiful. It won some of the greatest reviews of the entire year last year, but because it came out so late, the first weekend of December, it got very little attention in America. It was a monster yeah. hit in Britain. Yeah. And it got a little very little attention in America. It didn't even play Boston. The only place it played around here was up at um Cape Ann Cinema. Mm-hmm. And it was exclusive up there. And the people that see it fall in love with it. The music uh, that Luke Treadaway performs in this uh, was written by, co-written by the guy that used to be the lead singer for uh, the Dream Academy, Mm -hmm. uh, Life in a Northern Town. And the the original score by David Hirschfelder is just marvelous. And I I mean, it's... it, it, I can't speak. I can't describe how much I love this movie. It came this trying. close to winning my best picture last year. It was if, only beaten by, it, like, like two little hairs breaths by one. If you one, start but, talking about it and you start remembering it, you, you, your, your voice gets. It does, up. yeah, it because does. it's just a beautiful movie. You start wearing the ball again. It's really. It ridiculous. is available on Netflix, and I think it's also on Amazon. If you've never seen it, check it out. It's Num- actually also available on on-demand systems. If you have, oh yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably there. Is it free? Yeah. Uh, I think so. If not, then check it out. It's worth the rental, and you definitely will fall in love with the street cat named Bob, my mm-hmm. number two. Mm-hmm. We're okay. up to number one. I haven't yes. been able to figure out what your number one's going to be. Really? Yet. Yeah. Okay, I'm surprised. Um, my number one is a film that you've already mentioned. Um, my number one is Ketty. Oh, uh, it is? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, street Cat was almost my number one. It was between the two of them. I'm Me like, too. ah, dueling cat movies, I can't deal. Yeah. Because I love cats. I love um, cats. I love cats and dogs, but Ketty and Street Cat are just two movies that just blew our minds yeah. within months of each other. It's awesome. People have said I was a cat in a former life. Eat one raw mouse. and I you know. know uh, <laughs> you get such a reputation. You get such a bad rep. <laughs> but Ketty, the documentary about the semi-feral cats of Istanbul, Turkey, is... Um, it's magic. It's completely <laughs> it magic. When you think of that part of the country, uh, sorry, that part of the world, unfortunately, we here in America have this idea that all, you know, everything over there is all turmoil and destruction and bombs and terrorism and blah, 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 blah. You know, that's and- a great point because when we saw this movie, I was sitting, I feel like a doofus. I'm sitting there watching this movie going, I was expecting it to be like huts and like Taj Mahal type places and, and, it's a modern million plus city with a vibrant club scene at every I mean yeah. what how ignorant can I be? Istanbul is a freaking gorgeous city. It is city. beautiful. It, it is a very Oh beautiful my lord, place. it's beautiful. But but that well that's what we're used to seeing on the news here in America. Yeah. You know, yeah. people just think that whole area is all bombed out and war, death, terrorism, etc. blah blah blah. Um but when you see these cats and the fact that these cats are basically like, okay, fine. Here's humanity. Here's all its buildings. Quit following me with the camera. We ain't going anywhere. <laughs> We've been here for hi- We've been here for thousands of years. Yep. You move. <laughs> you don't like us being here. You move. Well, the, the people know? have been there for thousands of years too. But well, yeah, but the thing is, I just love the fact that the cats are like you know they've always coexisted throughout yeah. all that time. There's they never view- been an attempt to exterminate Un- yeah, them. Unlike unlike another like, wow. unlike another film, um, Tokyo Waka, which looks at the crows in Tokyo. Another great movie with the, the, with the animals in mind. Yeah, life. which they viewed as being pests and nuisances, and they were trying to you know eradicate, etc., cetera, so forth. This film is a great example of something that I firmly believe in my heart. You will never, ever, ever get rid of nature. No. Nature (laughs) always wins. Whether it's grass coming up through a crack in the sidewalk 
or birds building nests in a high office building. Nature is always going to go, hoo-hoo, I'm still here. You can't get rid of me. And and you know what's great proof of that? Check out an old TV show called Life After People. Mm-hmm. I adored that show. And it shows that this what nature this takes This is a over. great example of that with the cats, which yeah. are an extension of nature. All animals are extension of nature. That includes you and me. Um which most people want to forget. Mm-hmm. But the fact that these cats are just, you know, they're just, okay, I'm going to walk in this house now. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to walk out this house now, and I'm going to go down the street. Yeah. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to do that. Nobody's chasing them. Nobody's hitting them with brooms. Nobody's calling animal control. Nobody's throwing things at them. And these cats, and then you have the cats that are the mousers that know that they're doing something useful, but they're not being like, well, I'm doing something useful and helping humans. Aren't I great? The, the, the cat's whole thing is, I'm doing something like this because i got to eat. And I'm a cat. And well, it, it is sort of... Uh, I forget and which one that is. Yeah. I think that's Parcel, uh, uh, Parcel, Parcelani, uh, Ansel Parcelani. Well, the but cats like, are also like, yeah, you pet me. Yeah, I'm awesome. But I know. that mm-hmm. that mouser, he knows he'll be fed. If oh, he, yeah. Uh, but by, like good food if he, if he mouses. And and he likes that. Yeah, he does. And he enjoys being... You can tell he enjoy, really enjoys the soft stroke of that man who doesn't work anymore. He takes care of the cats in that yeah. area. Yeah. I mean, it's all amazing. these. See, the thing is, when people hear feral cats, they get put yeah. off because yeah. they think mangy, skinny, flea infested, possibly missing an eye, and dangerous. You know, and dangerous. <laughs> yeah, these cats are most, for the most part, not dangerous. These no psycho psycho psychopath is yes. I, uh, uh, <laughs> I I thought my she sister, is a scary cat. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought my sister's cat was was talking like, about a cat with, that w- w- that like. What is that? Um, whipped his her mate is totally uh, whipped. Oh yeah. my god, it's funny as hell. We're not going to finish that sentence because no. we get in trouble. Um, <laughs> fascinating, funny, and beautifully shot. Film. Oh yeah, absolutely fantastic. My number one film about live action animals, Keddy. My number one is one you already mentioned. Mm-hmm. Way lower than it should have been, and and it was. Yeah, I figured that from the disdainful tone. Yeah, so. um, I don't know what it was about this film. I I was interested in seeing it, but and I liked it when we saw it at the theater. But it was when it was on cable that it just took me over. I watched it constantly, and I was like, I can't get enough of this film. Not only because the star of it is one of my all time favorite actresses. I've loved her since she was a teenager. In the nineteen uh, seventy late seventies early eighties, starting off her acting career, but the movie itself is such a fantastic, beautiful story that you cannot um, you can't look away. And there's no doubt about it. I don't care how many times I see this film, and I watch that last race as Secretariat comes plowing around that corner, and the strains of Edwin Hawkins' singers "Oh Happy Day" starts. I just lose it. I love this movie. Diane Lane is one of my favorite actresses of all time. I've loved her since I first saw her in A Little Romance in 1979. She's she's my age. We're the same age. And I, I, I guess that's why I kind of gravitated to her. But um, over the years, um, she kind of slipped in and out of stuff. And then I started seeing her in later roles, and particularly in a 2007 film where she played Anton Yelchin's mother called Fierce People, that just convinced me once and for all this woman is one of the most underrated actresses of all time. Secretary, it was, should have been, if in, in a less competitive year, she would have gotten a Best Actress nomination. There were so many actresses that were just beating each other over the head for nominations that year that she mm-hmm. didn't really have a, cho- a chance. And the movie was not the big hit it deserved to be at the box office. It did modestly well, but um, the story, the true story of Secretariat and and his amazing, still unbroken uh, records uh, that he, he ran, especially the the the, pre, uh, the Belmont Stakes in in 1972 um, or 73, I forget which year. Um, it it's just amazing. It's a heartwarming, wonderfully uplifting story. Diane has some of the best players around her. Uh, the gentleman that played Eddie, the the the, the horse, um, the groom, the groom, just mm-hmm. passed away a couple a couple months ago. Um, John Malkovich is just brilliant as Lucian Laurent, the trainer. And those outfits are scary. And we've become, thanks to this movie, we discovered the wonderful talents of Margot Martindale, who is just 
brilliant in everything I've ever seen her in, mm-hmm. and I love her in this film. Plus, early roles for A.J. Machalka, and um, Dylan Walsh plays her her husband, and and it and and Penny Chenery is actually she also passed away this year, um, is actually in the sequence at the, where they're watching the race at uh, the Belmont. She's mm-hmm. one of the spectators. Um, it, it's just an amazing film, and it, and it always makes me come out with my heart beating hard and a big smile on my face. It's just terrific. My number one animal film of all time, 2010's Secretariat. Okay. <laughs> so let's go over our lists. Okay, starting with my list from 10 to 1. Number 10, The Adventures of Milo and Otis. Number nine, Moby Dick. Number eight, Greystoke, The Legend of Tarzan, Lord of the Apes. Number seven, Chicken People. Uh, Uh, Number six, Secretariat. Number five, Project Nim. Number four, March of the Penguins. Number three, Jaws. Number two, A Street Cat Named Bob. And number one, Teddy. So we actually did cross over with four films, which is pretty good for this kind of list. No, five films, excuse me. Um, my number 10, The Jungle Book from 2016. Number 9, Greyfriars Bobby. Number 8, Jaws. Number 7, The Incredible Journey, original one from 1963. Number 6, The Birds. Number 5, Benji the Hunted. Number 4, March of the Penguins. Number 3, Ketty. Number 2, A Street, Co- a street Cat Named Bob. And number 1, Secretariat. Okay. If you've never seen any of these films, most of them will probably be, you can probably find them somewhere on, on demand or on, on one of the services. Mm-hmm. The only one that might be difficult to find is probably Benji the Hunted. I don't think it's ever been released on DVD. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But definitely, I, and Greyfriars Bobby probably would take some digging too. And My Dog Tulip. Don't forget My Dog Tulip, which I talked about at the beginning of the show. Mm-hmm. We hope you like this week's list, and we hope you will contribute your ideas for lists at... Um, Front row at pnrnetworks.com. And uh, we have lots of, of great stuff, prizes and acknowledgments and all kinds of stuff. And, and credit on the show. Yes. If you, if you want to be a part of it. So please write us and let, you know, let us know what you think and give us your list ideas. If we use them, you get credit and a prize. Yep. All right. Okay. Your turn to pick. Um, I had an idea for a list, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, okay. Since we are talking about um, this this month on Subject Cinema in celebration of Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. we're doing a lot of shows about food and cooking and things like that in the movies and on TV. Mm-hmm. So I thought we would um, talk about food okay. on, our, on our next Front Row 5 and 10. And since it's a favorite subject of the both of us, I figured why not? Um, we're going to be doing our top 10 favorite ice cream flavors. Okay, that sounds fun. I don't know how we're going to last that for an hour, but it'll be... <laughs> well, you could talk, you could wax poetic about anything like that for a while. And we can talk about things where we've seen it and, and shows where it's featured and all yeah. kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, all month long on Subject Cinema, if you're listening day and date, uh, in uh, November 2017, we are doing foodie stuff, uh, f- movies and TV shows that feature food in honor of Thanksgiving. This week on Subject Cinema, if you listen to it day and date this upcoming week, we're going to be doing mostly documentaries. Mm-hmm. Really great food documentaries that probably slipped under your radar and that stuff that you would really enjoy watching. And they will sit there and please eat before you watch them. Because you'll sit there drooling if you don't. And that's coming up on Subject Cinema. That, and Subject Cinema is on every weekend, usually Sunday evenings, somewhere around 7 o'clock, uh, 7 to 8 o'clock. And uh, we hope you'll listen at SubjectCinema.com and eCinema1.com. Mm-hmm. We also have a number of other shows. Once again, I'm late on Catastrophe Vortex, my disaster movie show. It will be going up probably Sunday. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of fun with that. might be up on Saturday. And uh, it's where I talk about disaster movies, good, bad, and the ugly. It's all fun. And it's my show. It's at CatastropheVortex.com. Okay. And uh, my show, Platinum Rose's Garden, is mm-hmm. back. Um, I am looking at this season of Supernatural, which is season 13. And I'll be doing an episode recap of the most recent episode of Supernatural, Advanced Thanatology. So I hope you guys will come and check that Advanced out. Advanced what? Thanatology. Thanatology. Yes. Well, you can talk to me about that. What is later? Um, Before we, anybody goes, she made that up. No, it's a real word. It's I a real it title up. for them too. Yeah. 
Uh, we also have our, our mini shows on mm-hmm. Tuesdays and Fridays. Three Minute Weekend covers all the new film releases out every Friday. And Tuesday Digitex, all the home video releases every Tuesday. And they're on the same channel. Uh, yep. You can find those. We also have K-Babble with Eric and Valerie Lyons. Some great stuff coming from our friends in Missouri. Games, movies, books, odd things to eat, and more at kbabble.com. And although it's off for right now, Comic Grotto with Aunt BMP. We will be back uh, in January with new shows and Anthony is continuing to blog stuff so check out their website mm-hmm. at comicgrotto.com is there any other shows we've left out? no I think that's it yep that's it alright anyway it. <laughs> so this is Kim Brown and I'm TC Kirkham and we hope we can count on you to come back next week and help us count up our next list on Front Row 5 and 10 see you next week bye been listening to Front Row 5 and 10 with Kim Brown and T.C. Kirkham. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24-7. E-M-R.